By the 1920s, the Opera House was seeing fewer traveling dramatic companies and more silent movies. One description of the fair reads, Operettas from the 20s, Cherry Blossom, and The Rose of Killarney. Peter McConnell, a well-known writer and actor who hails from this area, recalled the last time Uncle Tom's Cabin was performed by a traveling troupe in 1927. That 10-year-old boy would take with him the vivid memory of the scene where Simon McGee chased Eliza across the ice cakes on the small stage. So many decades later, he still marveled at how real it seemed. But silent movies were the new and exciting form of entertainment that people wanted to see. One day, the paper read, Up on the silent screen, all in one bill, Charles Chaplin in The Rink, Clara Kimball Young in Eyes of Youth, plus Mutt and Jeff. 10,000 feet of film, come early to avoid the rush. Another example was on August 18, 1929, which advertised Tom Mix and Tony, along with good music by Mr. Robert Young at piano. The Opera House was the perfect place to show silent movies and enjoy the dramatic musical accompaniment of a talented pianist. People would pay 35 cents to enjoy such an evening of entertainment. Not everyone coped well with this new experience. The story goes that little Charlie Sanford was sent to a movie one Saturday night while his parents ran their store until midnight. Late in the first scene, Tom Mix came galloping straight for young Charlie. Not waiting to see how it turned out, Charlie raced out of the theater and hightailed it for home. These new moving pictures would take some getting used to. An activity we might not associate with the Opera House was badminton. Basil McMaster told of the wonderful new satin finish hardwood flooring that was installed in 1934 after considerable fundraising. Badminton courts were laid out on the floor so the local club could have an excellent place to play. Gerald Wright seconded that recollection about the badminton courts and would add that they also installed indirect lighting fixtures, which very much improved the quality of play. He also fondly recalled that he managed to obtain a summer job running the movie night at the Opera House. Now, how cool would that be for a summer job in the 1930s? The Cheer family was still very much involved in theater and music during the 1920s and 30s. Sam Cheer's troubadour days were over, but he remained active in theater production at the Opera House, along with his wife Alice and the children. Ruby Cheer, the youngest, born in 1904, provides her own point of view in these words. Over the years, the local young folk became interested in amateur plays. These were similar to those produced by ENSS students over the last 25 years. My father directed some of these amateur shows from time to time. It became a routine for years that the Methodist Church put on a show Christmas Eve and the Presbyterian Church on New Year's Eve. They alternated each year. With home talent, these were popular and filled the auditorium of the Opera House each performance. At first, I only watched these plays, but as I grew older, took part as an actor and even tried my hand at directing. I remember my father even had a couple of the grandchildren taking part towards the last of these church plays. Rose Ellery, a granddaughter of Sam Cheer and a well-known community volunteer, provided Ruby's comments as a guest speaker during our Dance Hall Days presentation in 2015. Rose was also involved in telling the story of the Opera House and the Cheer family in the Ghost Walks that were popular attractions during the summer months of 2011. These stories are an important part of the cultural landscape of Brighton. Royal celebrations continued to be popular events at the Opera House and the Town Hall. In 1937, the Mayor of Brighton, Ontario was invited by the Mayor of Brighton, England to attend a garden party in his town to commemorate the coronation of King George VI. On May 15, 1937, Brighton, Ontario held a reciprocal event at the Town Hall. Two years later, King George VI visited Canada, passing through Brighton on the train to the thrill of local store owners who decorated their store windows accordingly. One parade back in 1935 had been a bit less celebrated, but in the eyes of some, much more important. The Trekkers had marched all the way from Winnipeg, 
and passed in front of Wright's garage in Brighton, which was beside the town hall. They were heading all the way to Ottawa with the hope of impressing the, on the government of Canada the seriousness of the impact the depression was having on people. The trekkers made the newspapers for a few weeks, but were ultimately unsuccessful in moving the government to action. In the early 1920s, the Pleasure Palace at Presqu'ile was thriving as a dance hall with great bands and lots of events all through the summer. However, the pavilion was just one element of a larger vacation ecosystem. In fact, the pavilion was secondary to the hotel. The real money was in the wealthy hotel guests who came to stay in the hotel for a few days or weeks and spend lavishly on the extras at the dining room, the golf course, and the snack bar at the pavilion. Grant Quick responded to the ever-increasing demand for rooms at the hotel by undertaking a major renovation in 1922. Frank Bogue, the Toronto contractor who had built the Pleasure Palace, also was the contractor for these renovations. The result, finished in time for the 1922 season, was more rooms, larger and more luxurious rooms, a dining room twice the size of the old one, and a large portico with decks facing the bay. The guests would love it. The Brighton Ensign described it like this. The Presqu'ile Summer Hotel presents a most charming appearance outside with all its new improvements and additions. And inside is quite the last word in comfort and convenience as well as elegance. The new rooms and suites with their new furniture are most charming. But we venture the assertion that nothing is more highly appreciated than the running water and baths which were added this spring. Mr. Quick then set about bringing electricity to Presqu'ile. His brother, Royal Quick, was public utilities manager for Brighton at this time, and an arrangement was put in place whereby the PUC would install poles and wires from Brighton, across the marsh, all the way out to the hotel and pavilion, as well as the cottages along the bayside. This was very expensive, but well worth the investment. Running water and electricity were wonderful, but people came to the Pleasure Palace for the music. During the 1920s and 30s, there were dozens of different bands featured for a week or more. The band members would live in the barracks out back and get their meals at the hotel. The Brighton Ensign provides a partial list, including the Art Jewett Band, Gordon Winters and his band featuring Tony Calicut on piano. From 1924 to 1925, the Windsor Four Orchestra, later becoming the Windsor Seven. In 1930, the Blue Jackets, featuring Frank Barney Barnard, Eddie Musgrove, Bill Federico, Ernie Jonas. In 1936-37, a seven-piece orchestra from Ottawa, Al Saunders' Rainbow Review. In 1939, Skip Vaughan and his band. Prohibition took effect in Ontario in 1921 and was a problem that threatened the success of the Presqu'ile Hotel. However, Grant Quick was very astute, knew everyone involved, including all the local police and politicians. So we can expect that he quietly went about his business, keeping a low profile, but making arrangements for alcoholic beverages in a very discreet way. At least we have no public information that there was any trouble through prohibition all the way through to 1927, and the Liquor Control Board was put in place. However, prohibition was still in place in the U.S., and there was money to be made smuggling beer and whiskey into New York State. One of the most notorious of the rum runners on Lake Ontario, Ben Kerr, would make Presqu'ile his base of operations in the fall of 1928, when he rented the cottage immediately east of the hotel and across the road from the pavilion. Of course, everything was closed and vacationers gone back home, so Kerr and his sidekick, Alf Wheat, had the place to themselves. They ran mostly beer across the lake that winter, experiencing a close call in January when unusually cold weather and thick ice trapped them overnight on the lake. By sheer luck, they managed to free Kerr's fast, powerful boat, called Pollywog, and make it back to Presqu'ile. However, their luck did not hold on their next run in February 1929. They delivered a load of beer on the south shore and headed back across the lake. That was the last anyone saw Ben Kerr or Alf Wheat alive. Several weeks later, their bodies were found on the North Shore near Lakeport, along with the crushed remains of Pollywog. 
Such was the end of the notorious rum runner, Ben Kerr. The growing complexity of the Preskill Hotel moved Grant Quick to hire a professional chatelaine, a fancy name for hotel manager. Helen Faulkner had immigrated from England to Canada in 1920 and for a decade worked in several prestigious resorts in the Muskoka area and Bermuda. In 1929, she was living in Toronto, visiting her ailing father, Thomas Green, who was proprietor of the new Dunham Hotel in Coburg. The job at Presque Hotel was just what she needed, so she moved to Brighton with her son, Eric, and took over the day-to-day -day operations of Grant Quick's hotel. As it happened, Helen Faulkner was such a success as Chatelaine of Presque Hill Hotel, she ended up marrying the boss. On December 8, 1932, Grant Quick and Helen Faulkner were married and thus began a partnership that ran the hotel and pavilion for three decades. Mrs. Quick was very strict in handling the staff and making sure patrons of the hotel had everything they needed. Nothing got by the Chatelaine of Presque Hill Hotel. Popular events developed over the years at the Pleasure Palace, supported by Grant Quick and the staff. Commonly called the PAV, short for Pavilion, it was the site of activity almost every day of the week all summer. The opening gala, the first Wednesday in June, was highly anticipated. The girls fussed over their newest dresses and the boys donned white flannel and blue blazers. Tuesday night was the children's party organized by cottage moms with assistance from teens. They would often have 50 children from the cottages and campsites, all having lots of fun. Wednesday night was focused on the local working folks. The stores of Brighton closed at noon on Wednesdays so people could plan to head to the pavilion for an evening of dancing. Friday night was the novelty dance. There were five spot dances with prizes. And at the end of the night, parachutes filled with balloons, which had been hung from the rafters, cascaded onto the dance floor. Of course, Saturday night was the formal dress-up dance, which meant long dresses and suit and tie. Certainly it raised the anxiety level. Everybody wanted to look good. But it also provided the opportunity to feel special. What could be more fun than teenagers showing off in their best duds? And... Truth be told, there was a good deal of sparking and courting went on at these events, generating lots of gossip for the next day around the park. The social buzz around the pavilion and a hotel at Presqu'île grew in the 1930s and would be demonstrated by the publication of the Presqu'île Pointer, a newsletter about events and activity at Presqu'île. The editor was Clifford Y, and associates were Casey Corbett, Ruth Wilson, Francis Sloan and Bob Nesbitt. The issue of July 2nd, 1935 reported on the Presqu'île reunion dance that had been held on December 28, 1934 at the Royal York Hotel in Toronto. The group photo taken at this event shows a large gathering of folks, mostly younger, but with several apparent chaperones keeping close watch. Everyone is dressed to the nines and clearly enjoying themselves. It is useful for us to emphasize that this event was held in order to allow these younger people, who lived mostly around Toronto, to celebrate and socialize around their warm memories and experience at Presqu'île Park during summer vacations. By the 1930s, the summer habits of many prosperous Toronto families focused very much on Presqu'île, the hotel, the cottages, and that wonderful dance hall, the Pleasure Palace. Make no mistake, the folks in this picture were thinking about getting down to the cottage for the next summer's fun and frolic at Presqu'île. It was an institution. <music>